Procurement Media's Polity, Amlum Gilen Gompe. Joining me today is Professor Raymond Sadner, here to unpack part one of his Previn Gordon tribute titled, Previn Gordon Took on the Pain of the Oppressed as His Own. You start your article with a rather long quotation from Makudu Sefara's tribute to Previn Gordon. What do you think Safara captured to warrant so much space? Yes. Um, what I think he captured is the intricate way in which Pravin used to train people in responding to events. He didn't just say you must say go out there and help the people. He broke it down that you must be watching where the people need help in carrying the water and arrange the logistics for that. Where I'm staying, there's water outages, and they just say to us, the trucks are out there. Now, I will never be able to carry the water on my own, and there's no one to do it. Now, I'm not in the situation of the poor that these people were. I've got my own bottles here that I've stored over time. But there he asked himself, what happens when the water arrives? What happens when people can come back from work? Will there be uh will will they be will there be logistics to ensure that the water is up to standard, that the trucks are there on time and things like that? So what he was showing in that um statement was what seems straightforward is not straightforward, but the activists and the government workers on this thing must prepare themselves to ensure that every aspect of the tasks are met and prepared for. You refer to the period of the Indian Congresses and the UDF being one where organizations enjoyed an ambiguous legality. Can you elaborate, please? Also, if the African areas were so weak, why did they erupt so soon after this meeting? The legality was ambiguous in that and now a lot of us who worked together knew that we were also uh, attached to the underground or de facto members of the ANC or the Communist Party. It was all secret. You didn't say, I am a member, but we knew by the language we spoke that we were. And the things that we did were in line. We tried to make it to align it with what the ANC and its allies wanted. Um, if you look at the way uh, statements were phrased, all the our tactics and strategies that we followed, we tried to align these. At the same time, we didn't want to go straight back to jail for those who had been in jail or those who had been on the point of going to jail for a number of years. They didn't want to precipitate that. So we made sure if we got detained or questioned, that we asserted our legality. So having practiced that, when I came to be detained and they asked me a lot about people's power, I debated it with them. But I debated, it was different from in 1975 when I first went to jail. The people who interrogated me were fairly uh, acquainted with people's power, but particularly with what I had done because they wanted, I think they wanted to turn it into a treason charge as with the people from Alex, Moses, my Kiso and those people. So one wanted to be able to say to these cops, no, that's fine what you're saying, but everything that I did was legal. And so there was this ambiguity. In fact, you were trying to feed into insurrection, overthrowing the state, but you 
have this legal persona. You give lectures during the day, night you do these other things. You see, we must remember that not everyone went to jail in 1963. There were some cadres who were there in the townships, but also some people came out of jail and they got involved, both those categories of people got involved in reviving the ANC underground. And that was one of the spurs to, or the guidance to people who got involved in the Vol uprising and in other developments in Soweto and other parts of the Gauteng, what was Johannesburg and the uh, East, West Rand, all these places. Over the years, there was a pool of experienced people who could be drawn on. ANC hadn't been completely crushed, and it was rebuilding. You speak of province analytical powers from which you yourself benefited. How do you understand political analysis in the struggle of the time? Well, if we look at analysis in the media, it tends to be forecasting. Uh, it's a bit like uh, they spend their time saying, uh, what, does, what does this mean for the next ANC election? At this NGC that's coming, National General Council of the ANC, will there be a challenge to Surama Porcelain? What will that mean? Now, this to me is fortune-telling. And analysis is not fortune-telling, especially in politics. In Shakespeare, in Macbeth, uh, Macduff asks the witches, what seeds will grow? So you've got to ask yourself, what is going to, where, if you look at what's happening here, what has got the potential into, to grow into something more than they are now. And what Pravin would do is show you in looking at this thing, it's got a whole lot of factors at play, which are the factors to look at and how do we engage with those factors to make them grow into something that is a challenge to the regime in a range of different ways. And that's how analysis is. But if you look at the way the media operates, they they don't really have much to say. I mean, at this time when Pravin has just died, why is there so much nostalgia? What does the nostalgia mean? So there's a lot of things that need to be unpacked, and the media doesn't do it, and a lot of the comrades don't do it. That was Professor Raymond Sutner discussing his tribute to Pravin Gordon.